thanks again for joining me. Today, I am sitting down with Greg Steltenpole, who is the CEO of Calafia Farms, one of the largest, uh, fastest growing natural beverage companies in the US. He co-founded uh, Calafia Farms in 2010 with a farmer's cooperative based in San Joaquin Valley that is focused on creating healthy, delicious plant-based beverages. Uh, Greg is well known as the founder and CEO of Adwala, leading U.S. supplier of fresh juice and nourishing beverages. Greg led the company through its transformation from small startup to publicly held corporation uh, with an average growth rate exceeding 50% per year in building Odwala, Greg was a pioneer in employing ideas in, of environmental st uh, sustainability, uh, employee empowerment, creative corporate culture, and community-based marketing. Odwala was sold off to Coke, was part of uh, the Coke brand for uh, over 10 years. Greg is a serial entrepreneur. I'm very excited to unpack his playbook, understand how he came uh, to be who he is today. So thank you, Greg, for sitting down. I really appreciate Thank you. It. Really excited to be with you, Scott, and um, love being in the good company you've had on the show so far. No, it's, it's my pleasure. Um, you, are, you are the epitome of what entrepreneurs strive to be. You took a company from startup to publicly traded, and now you're on to the next venture. But that doesn't happen overnight, as we all know. So how did, how did your career start? Where did you come from in university, jobs, moving into entrepreneurship? Walk me through your journey. Well, um, you know, it, it's funny how things, you know, you try to pinpoint a starting point. And, and in my case, uh, a book literally fell off a bookshelf in front of me. Um, and that book was called 100 Businesses You Can Start for $100. Um, my only problem was I didn't have that hundred dollars. So, um, I, you know, the, the origins of Odwalla, uh, have to be traced back a, a little bit further than that. Um, you know, I was raised in a family that, uh, my father absolutely adored fresh squeezed orange juice. And, um, it was a ritual at our, you know, morning table. Uh, ever since I was a little kid. And uh, I lived in both Florida. And uh, when I was quite young, six or seven years old, we moved to Southern California. And growing up in Southern California around the orange groves was, uh, you know, just had a lot of great memories for me. And the romance of the smelling the orange blossoms and just seeing the incredible output of those trees obviously registered something in my imagination. So flash forward many years later, um, I studied environmental sciences at Stanford. And when I got out, this was in the you know, late uh, 1970s, and I had this degree that there really wasn't any place for other than um, kind of greenwashing big developments that oil companies were doing or kind of fighting uh, alongside the Sierra Club and, and, and trying to establish some early, um, you know, nonprofits that, that would resist some of the environmental damage that was uh, happening back in those days. So I chose a different route, which was just to think about how things were going wrong in the first place. And I just started thinking about business as creating a lot of the problems, but uh, I felt like businesses could be redesigned. And um, that, and, and because I love food and agriculture, um, when that book fell down off the bookshelf in front of me, I kind of put two and two together and said, maybe I should, uh, you know, quit quit stalling on this dilemma and and start something from scratch and uh so um one of the little ideas of this business of a hundred businesses was a a kind of glorified fruit stand which um and the people said you could franchise brand and extend out and have have these little you know lemonade and fruit stands all over the place so I really didn't like the idea of retail. So I thought, 
you could grow something much bigger if you are a supplier and and got into creating something that could really literally be everywhere and um that's how the idea of odwala got started and literally you know borrowed a couple of hundred dollars um bought a little hand squeezer a box of oranges some empty bottles and uh squoze the first few batches in the kitchen kind of got kicked out of the kitchen into the back shed from there we got a little place that you know of a few hundred square feet to to put a little semi-automatic machine and odwalla just took off uh like a weed back in the 1980s being one of the very first sort of natural food businesses and as you as you that was your first venture so i'm sure there was tons of learnings um walk me through growing that venture what did you learn about entrepreneurship what are things that you wish you had known um some of the pitfalls stresses as as it grew i'm sure there's a, a whole other podcast of <laughs> just speaking about right. that but. well you get you know the there is a gene in my <laughs> experience but i also think it's it's a bit like the debate of nature versus nurture entrepreneurs can be born but they also have to be made uh at, at least if you're going to succeed um over time and i i think that we also overglorify them in some ways so uh i think there's a lot of dark sides to entrepreneurship that we can get to into a little later that um i i just don't think it it's a um panacea for the world's problems and i think in reality there's true entrepreneurs everywhere especially in developing countries where people have to be so creative just to get by on a few dollars a day so I I feel like quite humbled by the experience and you know some of the romanticization of it but I think it also there's a spirit to it that really is contagious and that people really do gravitate around uh and it brings out the passion in people and that you know you can have a purpose and you can have you can have a great business idea and a business model you can have a great design you can have all those you know interesting ideational beginnings but at the end of the day there's got to be a lot of grit and and passion to get you through the series of you know quite frankly kind of never ending challenges and um and then you have the challenge of success and and how how do people overcome that in a six, you know in a healthy way um so th- those are some of the interesting territories but if you ask me you know entrepreneurs i think are kind of forged in the kind of trouble they get into <laughs> just yeah. by going yeah. after what they first started and thought they had some idea about <laughs> i i think that um one theme that i see a lot on on this show when i speak to people that have done their own thing that have built their their own business from the ground up it's it's the overglorification of entrepreneurship and sometimes how everybody wants to be an entrepreneur but they don't realize the, the struggles that that you can go through uh, but you've you know you've literally gone through the in, the entire gamut you starting from a couple bucks to to publicly traded um now i'm curious because as you start to go towards the route of you know it's growing growing you have many many employees multi-million dollars in revenue and now you're looking to exit go public what what at that point when do you decide that you when do you decide, you decide that you want us to do something you to move on to other things well i you know sometimes I I mean it's super interesting question because you know the um entrepreneurs have a particular challenge in separating their identity uh from um what they do and 
I believe that that's, you know, when I was talking about the problems of success, that's one of the things and one of the things that um, entrepreneurship can be a compulsion and, you know, compulsions are really not the healthiest form of behavior. So I think it take, it does take a lot of self-examination and certainly I would have to fall in that bucket since I'm in my 40th, 40, going into my 40th first year of being an entrepreneur and having been a serial entrepreneur. Um, you know, I actually am at a stage of life where I, you know, asked some tougher questions about where, you know, where is truly the right legacy? What is the right legacy to leave given my span of experience and how can I best contribute, you know, the point of view to help the next generation of entrepreneurs overcome, you know, some of the downsides uh, yeah. of what we may have created. And, you know, I think people, um, we don't have to look any farther than a lot of the current crop of big technology entrepreneurs now who live in literal worlds of their own and are now going off world almost, you know, there's yeah. three different entrepreneurs that are in the race for space and to be the first to colonize another planet. And um, meanwhile, back at the ranch, you know, I think we have a lot of, we haven't even unwound the colonization you know, that we've done on this planet. So I have a lot of, you know, mixed feelings about how entrepreneurs sometimes get separated from a greater social fabric uh, because of their success, extreme success, you know. And um, so for me, I think social entrepreneurship should not be like this separate calling I mean, my wish is that that dialogue was much more sophisticated around how we build companies where the social entrepreneurship, meaning, you know, not just responsibility, but actually creatively embracing, you know, issues and frictions in society and then taking them and transforming them into something that's more um, aspirationally exciting to people and, and um, renewing, you know. Um, and we've used that word disruption, that the word disruption and celebrated disruption. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's a little more nuance to it. I think, you know, re anything that's re, you know, regenerate, renewal, reinvigorate, you know, um, th these, um, replacement, um, metaphors for, things that have kind of run their course and need to be re-examined from scratch are the kind of ideas uh, that I'm really interested in. And at Calafia, um, I'm, you know, I'm an entrepreneur who's in my 60s. I was in my 20s when, you know, Odwalla got started. I was in my 30s when we went public. And when you're in that stage, there's there is a glory dog. I mean, you just think that each stage is another rainbow. And um, we got hit by a E. coli, um, you know, contamination uh, when our company was about 16 years old at Odwalla. And, and we were publicly held. And the world just, for our world, just ground to a stop. Um, the press, and media was almost like a Michael Jackson story because, you know, we were such a kind of darling of California and all this stuff. And when uh, people thought that this, this fresh juice was making people sick, it was too irresistible of a story uh, and a downfall. Um, so we had to work our way back up from that over a multi-year period where we lost 90% of our sales and, you know, for a while, people thought of the brand as a, as a pariah. Um, and, you know, I, I was really felt ashamed of the fact that we actually, you know, could have made people sick. So I think that these kind of rites of passage, when you get older, you look at them and you actually don't want to trade them in. <laughs> uh, 
I guess is, you know, my takeaway from those things. I, I yeah. never want to go through it again, but the tempering that happens and I guess the, like the priority for me in building a new food company like we have, which is many times the size of Odwalla at this point um, for Calafia is that, you know, how do you, how do you try to change the food system from scratch? How do you try to rebuild it in a different way? How can you design food safety into the integral DNA of the company from the very beginning? Um, those are the kind of things that um, get more interesting rather than just another public offering or X, you know, billion dollar valuation or whatever, yeah. you know, an exterior benchmark that gets put out in front of, you know, most people. And, and I think that it makes you very con it, it, like you just said, it, it makes you hyper conscious of, of what really matters in a, in a corporate environment. Um, you know, you went through a, a tough time and it's unfortunate, but I, I love it. Like you, you, you hold that with you and you use that going forward in other organizations, in, in Califia and in, in anything you touch, right? If, if, if this is a core tenant of, of you as a, as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, as a founder, that's going to permeate whatever organization, whether or not you're advising a younger entrepreneur, or whether or not you're building something out. Now, I guess my, my curiosity, my question is, it's important to have environmental sustainability, employee empowerment, creative corporate culture, community-based marketing. These are all incredible initiatives that I think really differentiate companies in a good way. How, how are some ways that you actually achieve these so that they're not just, and there's a, there's a wide gamut, I think, of activities that could achieve these, um, but what are some of your favorite things that Califia does different? Great question, and, and thank you for that. And it is, you know, at the end of the day where the rubber meets the road, because, well, you know, talk is cheap, as everybody said, and even companies need to be aware that people nowadays want to know where the receipts are, you know, in other yeah. words, you know, like, what, what did you really do? That's what you said you wanted to do, but what did you really do? And I, uh, you know, I aspire to make Califia's um, main business as close to a, you know, regenerative type business for the planet and for individual people who actually consume the product as possible. And for its image and its brand and everything that it stands for, to be actually functional in a like socially and cultural positive way. And I think those three parts, you know, the community, culture, social part, the personal health standpoint, because we're a food company. So at the end of the day, what we materially make goes materially into people's bodies and materially has an either health promoting effect or a health del deleterious effect. So, and then finally, there's a carbon footprint and, and or what we call food print, which is not just carbon, but water, land, atmosphere, all, all the different aspects of environmental consumption or benefit or exchange that the company actually does. So the, first of all, the very exciting premise of you know, trying to create a new food system is that a food system of the future has to be plant-based for it to make sense. It doesn't mean everyone in the world has to be a vegan, but it does, does mean that the majority of food that we consume has to have a smaller, um, you know, ecological footprint um, because we don't have the remaining land we don't have enough water, fresh water, that's available between what people need directly and, and what the farms need to, to go through the secondary transformation that happens within an animal, where the water use is usually five to 10 times what it is to go directly in the caloric you know, exchange between a plant and then a human. So that's first and foremost. So we find that it can boil down to a simple 
a understanding that, you know, if you drink a pint beverage, that pint weighs, weighs a pound. Well, literally by switching from a pint of dairy milk to a pint of plant milk, you will save a pound of carbon in the atmosphere. So since the average person consumes over a ton of food per year, that literally we can, each of us, save a ton of carbon by essentially having a primarily plant-based um, diet. And that environmental impact alone is more than almost any other single action or transformation that a human being can do for the benefit of the environment without depending on anybody else and without depending on legislation, you know, governmental interference or guidance, um, no matter how you look at it, it's just a single willful act and decision that people can do. So I was greatly excited by that concept. And I realized that you can't wag your finger at people to get them to, to be plant-based. The best way to do it, A, is make it taste great and B, create an exciting brand and initiative and, you know, communication program behind it. So that's what we've been trying to do. And other companies like us are joining in that. And that, you know, once you go down that road, you examine, it allows you to examine everything else you do, like just filling products full of sugar, whether they're plant-based or not, creates diabetes creates easier susceptibility to, you know, both chronic disease and those chronic diseases make somebody more susceptible to um, immune attacking, you know, uh, organisms like COVID. So, like, no matter how you look at the circle, it's so interesting that if you, if you look at it as a exciting challenge instead of an, uh, you know, uh, responsibility box to check, then I think transforming companies and, and transforming the food system is very much within the reach of a single generation. And um, that's the kind of thing that kind of turns, I think, the people at Calfeon and myself still at my age. And um, it really is that when you see the possibility of change, and the power is in the consumer uh, and the citizen, not only in the hands of something so big you feel you can't make an impact. Uh, and that's literally the spirit of entrepreneurship, that in itself. So yeah. for me, for, like the ability to transmit the idea that action and possibility exists, that's, as an entrepreneur, I've always been shocked that so many people just don't, <laughs> they don't feel that. And, and so, um, you know, it starts with being a part of it. And then hopefully people discover their own initiatives. You don't have to start big companies, you know. Um, so I think societal transformation is an imperative. And um, I'm just like super thankful that I could have the opportunity to, to make really great healthy products in California, which is a, a, a state that appreciates it. And um, it's a state where so many innovative ideas are coming out, but we've had some unhealthy ones come out of here too. So <laughs> we, we, we have to keep the, keep the bow of the boat pointed in the right direction. Man. Very, very well said. Um, and I appreciate you, you highlighting that because I think that that's something that escapes a lot of first time entrepreneurs who are very much focused on the six, on their perceived notion of success, as opposed to what success really is. Once you, once you have figured out how to hit those traditional benchmarks, I call them traditional just because they're probably the way that most businesses benchmark themselves, uh, probably for the, for the wrong, that's, it's not the right way to benchmark yourself, but uh, when you start a business, you want to be profitable. You want to appease your shareholders, your investors, whatnot. Um, but that's not the only way to build a business as you, as you can see, like you're living, you're literally living proof of how to build a business that is socially conscious. Now, my question is to build a business that's socially conscious, you have to get everybody on board or it's going to be very hard. It's going to be an uphill battle and by everybody. I mean, like your, your culture, your employee, your, the people that you hire and you bring into 
into your organization. And you mentioned everyone at Calafi is very, uh, is very proud of the work that you do. So for somebody who's building an organization, how, how do you find those people that are in tune with what you're doing? Well, I, I mean, you hit a very good point around the team and, uh, you know, obviously I'm the guy on the show here, whatever, but we have, <laughs> you know, 300, 300 employees and we have some incredible leadership in the company that's distributed through all different aspects of the company. And we're vertically integrated. So we have manufacturing, we have, you know, raw material sourcing, we have logistics, we have IT, we have, you know, huge financial infrastructure, we have investors from all different parts of the world. Um, you know, so these, these things never happen as a result of just one person's effort. But I think the entrepreneur bears a unique responsibility, particularly in the early stages, to, you know, they have to embody what it is that your the mission is about. And if it's not really a mission and it's just fishing around for an opportunistic business plan and then getting people fired up around that plan, I, you know, the longevity is probably going to be under question. Um, I think resonance for me is the word that is really important when it comes to people and how to hire and bring the right people on board. And, you know, I continue to make mistakes um, personally. So I, I think anyone would be lying if they thought <laughs> they found really the solution um, because you know, things ultimately become really important too, are things like loyalty and things like um, consistency, humility. Uh, so not just people who work hard and not just people who have certain skill sets uh, or may be massively productive. So uh, that alignment and, you know, ultimately being in tune with each other, um, you can do extraordinary things. And the more that you can accomplish much, much more when there is a minimal of internal friction, because organizations that drag themselves down with too many internal processes or too many internal uh, points of conflict or too many chiefs uh, can never really have enough energy to successfully compete or you know, make their marketing goals really work because that energy was chewed up on the inside. So um, you, you, you need to catch, you need to set your sails and catch the winds of the environment where the strength is much bigger and um, too much internal focus sometimes also makes companies too team oriented and not enough paying attention to their customer. So being customer focused is one of the challenges that I find amongst executives the hardest to find um, because I think you can't just rely on the marketing department for that uh, or else you again cause a lot of unnecessary meetings and they become the sole defender of the point of view of the, you know, the end consumer when, you know, you would get there a lot faster if people thought about those no matter what role they had in the company, right? And then they would be bringing that point of view to the table. So um, you can't, there, no cute answer for it. Um, I think you always have to just be awake in an interview. I personally have learned to do at least three in-person in interviews before making a decision because I find that the first, definitely the first time people can bowl you over with their energy and enthusiasm. Second time, they don't have quite as much. Third time, they might drop a lot of, <laughs> you know. They become the real self, right? <laughs> right. So it's kind of wear them down and then see what yeah. they're really made of, right? But yeah. No, not, not really. But I do think you have to uh, yeah. go, be, go beyond, you know. You can't take things at face value. You mentioned a really good point there. Um, uh, when everybody's responsible for customer success, that's, that's evangelism, right? Across the whole organization. Um, I spoke, go ahead, sorry. Well, I was just going to say like plant-based. I mean, yeah. we, we are not a company of 100% vegans and 
you know, when you have a, you know, hundreds of people and, you know, it's a democracy and I, I like people doing things for reasons that they internally have gone through a process and they appreciate. So, and like I said, it's not about veganism, but it is about understanding why plant-based is important and, you know, factory treatment of animals in my own belief system is not ethical. And, you know, there, there are ways that, you know, it can be done and there are ways that it shouldn't be done. And you also have to look at what kind of system you support through your dollars. And, you know, we're voting our dollar with every, every time we lay it down to buy any meal. Um, yeah. And I, you know, having people who realize that, well, let me give you a little example for Calafia. Calafia started literally, um, you know, it was for a whole different reason. We were concerned about the food waste that was going on with the citrus crop in California. And 20% of it was literally going to the cows. And what it took was an entrepreneurial commitment from this group of farmers that, that I got into a partnership with. And the other thing was my own love of citrus combined with, a, you know, just a persistence in solving some problems that hadn't been solved before. But along the way, you know, there, there was another problem that happened between some of the citrus partners. So, you know, we, we were able to pivot the business to plant-based milks. And just in parallel with this, Coke had, had gotten Odwalla and grown it along a pathway. So in the time, because when I started making the plant milks at Calafia, lower sugar was a core tenant. And we also had this this maxim of something different, something better. We didn't need a complicated Ten Commandment, you know, set of, you know, um, core values, other than understanding what did something different and something better mean, and something that was truly healthful, and we couldn't be in the sugar game. And because in beverages, I hate to say it, but in most cases, it has been all about the sugar game. And that, by refusing to play that game, we distinguish ourselves so that our number one selling product became a 40 calorie per serving unsweetened almond milk. And meantime, Coke turned Odwalla from an average of having between 110 to 120 calories to having an average caloric count of between 240 and 280 during that same period of time. So now Coke stopped selling product at Odwalla. I just had one, uh, the superfood product, had six times the amount of calories that are all the best selling product at Calafia has of 40 calories. So these are the things that if you don't have the value system in place, you just won't end up making those decisions. And today, Calafia serves over a million and a half servings a day. So that's a million and a half times a day that someone is saved from a sugar overload. So yeah, I, that's I a health, that's a, to their health. Yeah. Like that's an incredible number that you're, you're so, saving from that. And you know, when, when you, and if you think about every entrepreneur, if every entrepreneur could tackle their idea system a little bit, you know, with the environment and with people's health in mind, it doesn't matter what people would do. I think we'd end up with the world we wanted because people embrace those companies. I mean, it's a, the brand love that, that people get when they really commit to those, those same values is you can't buy it. And literally, that's the other thing about the approaches you asked me in the question about community-based marketing, for example, is one of the things you listed. Community-based marketing means the dollars you spend circulate right back in locally used or in the parts of the community that most need those dollars. If, for example, all you do is television advertising, who benefits from that? 
the television the network, the yeah. advertising, the broadcasters. That's where it all goes. And that goes in inside of only a corporate ecosystem. If you support the local schools, the, the whatever, the PTA, the, you know, the food program for gardening, the, you know, and in our case, we're trying to use our own supply chain to get our product to underserved, what you call food deserts, food swamps, inner city places where natural food products are needed the most, but are least accessible. So that's the kind of thing that I talk about when you use your business model to actually do the thing you talk about. These so, are the things, oh, no, I was gonna say, this is just something that we're, we're seeing people want from companies more and more. And this is not reactionary on your part either. I wanna highlight that. This has been your core tenant for a, a while, but now companies are trying to jump on this bandwagon. Well, it's a good bandwagon to be on if you really actually do it. So, yeah. I mean, for example, we you actually have to worry about it because there, there is backlash, almost a kind of reversal that happens when people try to find the faults of people, which, which is a healthy, you know, I think a skeptical, healthy point of view. But mm -hmm. we just made a million serving pledge about three months ago to get a million servings of our product out to, you know, as donations, this is not um, a sale, you know, a product to, you know, sell to the consumer, but get to those people on the front lines of the COVID battle. So whether it was nurses, daycare people, homeless shelters, food banks, whatever it is. And, you know, at least at this point, and we said we would do it by the end of the year. And I think we're already at a 90% fulfillment rate of that pledge. And we want to re-up it again. Um, but those are the things that companies can look at because there are things that can be done that don't necessarily hurt profit margins, but actually employ the work of everyone in the company and just apply it to a little better end. And I think that's, that's the sort of win-win and, you know, use the, use the operations of the business to actually do even more good um, is kind of my own idealism about the right way to handle uh, community-based, um, you know, uh, help. Uh, very, very well said. Um, we, we've covered a lot about uh, Califia. I want to, I want to ask you some uh, sort of life lesson insight questions from yourself. But before I go into that line, um, and they're, they're a little bit, uh, they're more rapid fire than anything. Uh, I wanted to just uh, give you the floor. Was there anything that I don't know about Califia that you're excited about where the company's going, where you want to see it, uh, go that you're working on right now, things like that. Well, I think that the, um, directions for us as a company being a plant-based pioneer and, and brand is that we view, you know, the products of an animal-based food system, meaning, you know, there's a whole spectrum of activities that go from mostly related to cows, but extends into chickens and eggs and to, you know, pigs and sheep and all kinds of other species. But, the cow, because it's related to dairy milk, is the one that Calfi is most directly looking to supplement um, and, and replace as a mainstream kind of core um, product stream. And if you think about uh, dairy milk as a kind of, and the production of dairy as a kind of refinery system. So just like crude oil goes into a big factory and comes out as plastic, it comes out as jet fuel, it comes out as tar and oil, it got, it's got all, all these different things that comes from crude. Well, the same, you know, raw milk comes into a big factory system and is separated by weights of fat and densities and all kinds of things to become cheeses and, and um, butters and spreads and everything else. So when you go at it from a plant-based point of view, this is what the vision that Calfia is trying to go. And we just launched plant butters. We mm -hmm. just launched 
a, a product with plant proteins that come from peas and rice. Uh, we, we are moving into spreads and, and in the direction of, of things that can replace cheeses. So those, that whole spectrum is such a large part of land use in America. You know, the, the bulk of where dollars go from the consumer you know, we are talking about things that are on the order of 25, 30 billion, you know, dollars worth of uh, expenditure every year just for what the consumer is paying in, in retail. So this world of, you know, whole different way of doing things by partnering with plants is just the biggest message that I think Calafia wants to bring. And we have embraced, you know, and, and are looking to evolve this model of commu community-based marketing into not just a project or a program that we do annually, but to work with other businesses to figure out systemically how do we address, you know, how systemic racism has embodied itself in the food system, for example. And, you know, getting high quality, high nutrient dense products into those communities at an affordable price is a kind of challenge that we can't undertake by ourselves as a company, but we really have to participate in with a vision. And, you know, we've been able to partner with visionary retailers like Target. We've been able to partner with NGOs and large nonprofits like, you know, Feeding America. And those type of partnerships are can be sort of the next generation's food system vision and that that's really what i wanted to convey that i think is possible i think that i think that everything you're doing is uh and i didn't realize going into this all the initiatives that uh you were actually engaged in so i you know i appreciate the conversation but i think that everything you're doing should be um, a, a beacon for other companies to emulate uh, because just being aware of all these things that you have impact over and all, especially because you deal with health and, and, and the, again, the, the things that people put into their body, um, not only being just like a, a socially conscious company, but being a, a health conscious company and all these things uh, and the way you lead and the way you manage the, the culture of the organization, um, everything is like checking those boxes off that that I think are good things for a company to emulate. So um, I hope I hope the people listen to this, and if they are if they are in more traditional structures that perhaps unfortunately don't focus on on all the things that you mentioned, um, that they start to investigate at least and understand how their company within their own specific industry or ecosystem can have more of a forward thinking. I call it forward thinking. I really should think it should just be the way you think, but a forward thinking <laughs> view on how to, yeah. how to, you know, run an organization. So hats well, off to you for that. Very, very well. Good. Thank you, Scott. But really, you know, it is time. The time is now. And I think COVID gave a mm. reset button, you know, for, in so many ways. And hopefully people, you know, by having more times with their family, more times to make their own food, you know, just more occasions to put into question the daily practices and so on. And really, Calfi is part of a much bigger movement that many, many young people are already born with an attitude, you know, around what has to mm -hmm. be. And I just, I, I think my biggest role is that their dreams can be possible and they can do it, but it does take commitment and it does, you know, it doesn't happen that easy. And listen, you can pick up the fight anywhere along the way. Mm -hmm. You know, entrepreneurship, we, I started the company, it was actually an entrepreneurial part of this farming company. And I was a division, I was creating a new division for them. But, you know, this, this is not, um, it, it can happen for people inside of big companies. Um, but you do have to take a stand at one point and stand for something and mean it. You know, you yeah. got to, you, you do, you just have to. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, whether you're plunking down your own cash or all your sweat equity, you, you just, 
even in work, sometimes it's an unpopular decision that has to be made or an unpopular point of view. And if you lose your job because you said something, then, you know, then, not the right spot for you. Right. And yeah. pick up where that leaves off. And yeah. Like I got, I just, this last story, because I, I, I think it's an example of that. Yeah. I was just before I started Calafia, I was um, a founder, a co-founder of another company. And that company had raised capital was, I had the involvement of the former chairman of Pepsi in the, involved. And another guy was a big entrepreneur. Um, you know, a lot of big shots were involved in the thing. And it was great. And we were trying to bring women products from Africa here, raw materials and had great aspirations. But at the end of the day, you know, there were too many cooks and not, not, not enough people, you know, serving the food. Right. And I, uh, you know, I, w I realized my own internal unhappiness. And so I just, I left. And it's the first time it was so hard for me as an entrepreneur to leave. And I left and literally the next day, <laughs> without any provocation, there's a guy on the phone and it turns out to be this guy, you know, Bert Evans, who owned the Sun Pacific and was the head of this big co-op. And so th there was no connection, literally. He had no knowledge that I was leaving my other company. <laughs> so it was just, because I did that out of principle and out of what was being true to myself, literally the next day, um, you know, that, that uh, the new opportunity came and that became, you know, the destiny of Calafia. So um, I love that stuff. And, you know, sometimes the world laughs at you too, because the first CEO that they sent in after I had left uh, Odwalla uh, was a guy named Sugarman. <laughs> <laughs> and he turned out to be a great guy, but the irony of Coke buying it and then putting in a guy who had the name Sugar Man was a bit too much, right? <laughs> it's a little ironic. A little, a little, you know, life's, life's a funny thing. Life's a very funny yeah. thing. And, you know, yeah. the Sugar Man story is funny, but, you know, what you just mentioned about you leaving the next day. I don't think there's too many people. I don't know actually anybody who's left something of their own will and regretted it ever. Something always yeah. happens. Interesting. Something, Interesting. Yeah. something well, always you, happens. Yeah. You've heard enough uh, hot air from all of us on your show to know, <laughs> to know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So, a, a lot um, of entrepreneurial stories. Yeah. Like well, that. that's great. Well, I, um, you know, I, I wish that people really take the deeper message from these kind of conversations and and do go out and act on what they really believe in and that's the biggest fun of of it yeah, yeah. that's the real essence of entrepreneurship yeah very very good okay um i have a couple rapid fire life lesson insight questions um and then uh and then i'll uh, and then i'll figure out where people can go and find more about you and calafia even though i'm sure it's just, it's just the website but regardless i'll get some <laughs> other links from you um so what would be what would be uh, a, a resource? It could be a person. It could be a book. Uh, it could be a podcast that you learn from that you'd advise other people to go check out. Um. Well, I I would first of all, I'm kind of a omnivoric book reader, buyer, consumer. And I just, and I'm, I'm my own personal mentors, aside from Steve Jobs, who was, was, you know, probably the closest thing to a business person, but I regarded him more as an artist and designer, you know, type, um, you know, soul. But I, I think that um, it's always hard for me because, you know, I literally devour stuff um, from so many sources. Hmm. But um, for a long time, Odwalla supported a group called the Bioneers. And uh, that's, you know, uh, like pioneers, but hmm. Bioneers. And the Bioneers uh, is all about practical solutions for restoring the environment. Um, they usually have cutting edge speakers, resource series, uh, all really based around tackling tough questions. And um, 
for example, Paul Stamets, who's one of the godfathers of the rebirth of mushrooms and, uh, you know, in all their applications, um, was first kind of, you know, got audience based out of Bioneers. So that would be the top of mind one for me here. Um, you know, if people are in the food industry and they don't, you know, subscribe to Food Navigator, for example, I think that's like really a right on um, hub for, you know, um, you know, discovering uh, what's going on on, on food industry. Um, other than that, man, it's just follow your passion. I, mm -hmm. you know, whatever is, is, is parking your interest, just go deeper into it. And as soon as you go deeper, it will just lead you to the next thing. And you're talking to a guy who loves the east side of the Sierras, the wild side, you know, I, you know, to go somewhere without a trail and yeah. navigate by, by the landscape, you know, that's my idea of, you know, like real fun. So, and you do it by paying attention and then figure out where you want to go. So you just put the two things together and usually, um, you know, you, you can avoid being lost. And part of navigation is pay attention to big features and understand the weather. And, um, you know, the weather is a metaphorical thing for the, the, the ecosystem, for whatever is the bigger system that encompasses mm -hmm. the system we're in. So we all learned that the United States is not the be all and end all. It's part of a bigger system. And whatever system of capitalism and, and uh, free trade and globalism, it's inside the system of our total Earth atmosphere. So regardless of what, how big we think we are, we're always inside of a different system. <laughs> and um, so that's a, a world within worlds is kind of the foundation of the whole concept of ecology. Um, so I resist, other than plugging the Bioneers and, you know, uh, I, I would resist any easy answer to your question. But you do promote a very, uh, a very insightful way of looking at the world which will lead to many more answers than just giving a book title. So <laughs> I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Right. Very good answer. Um, what, uh, what would be a, a lesson that you would tell your younger self? Oh, trust, uh, trust yourself more. <laughs> and believe in yourself more. Um, listen, listen to the deeper part of yourself more, but always have an inquisitive mind, including about yourself. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I have to define self. I don't believe in a self. I believe in selves. And, and you know, mm -hmm. we, we have an internal community inside of ourselves, just like we have the, the modern ecology is, is just like we are literally uh, a walking bunch of biomes, right? We have a, a skin biome. We have an intestinal biome. We have like biomes in all, all different parts of ourselves, just like plants do. They have a, the, there's a biome on the surface of the leaf. There's a different biome in the root system. There's a different biome in the, in the um, canopy in the, uh, at the top of the plant in the bark. So like we are just way more complex than any of us imagine. And so I think that when we start thinking about self-improvement or we start thinking about how to, to, to um, think of ourself, that I just encourage curiosity and openness and lack of certainty as one of the healthiest points of view to, to lead you in the right direction. Um, there was an old guy, Alan Waza, he had a book called The Wisdom of Insecurity. But, you know, people think insecurity is a bad thing. You know, they think it, it's paranoia, but insecurity means you just always just have a little bit of caution involved. You always have a little bit of question involved. And if anything, I think the world today needs a precautionary principle before jumping in and, you know, running around and altering it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that, I think we've, 
uh, ran around and altered it too much. <laughs> so we're at the point where I think we do have to be a little bit more cautious because there's not so much to run around with anymore. We're, um, well, we've, yeah. I, I'm, I'm passionate about the discussion and I, I don't want to overstep my bounds of this, so I'll keep it extremely short, but I, 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 <laughs> I sounds, not. this is great. It, Thank it, you. It, it sounds contradictory for a guy on an entrepreneurship show to be talking about being cautious. Okay. And anyone who knows me and I've probably been involved in, I, I don't even want to count the price hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of launching products. So, um, but I do think that how we do things, it, that is a big question nowadays. The how of things is, is, is the answer to, to the why. <laughs> you know, why we do things is in how we do things. So I think that there's, a, there's something worth, you know, thinking about in the middle of that. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and, and last question, uh, and these are all very open-ended. That's why you're a great guest, by the way, because you take the open-ended and you run with it. Some people are very <laughs> short and succinct, but I like, I like when, you, when you go into the depth of how you come to an answer on these things, because I, I'm not sure if, you're, if you probably are, you're very self-aware of how you communicate, but you do have a very strong opinion, but then there is a story that comes to a logical conclusion. And I really appreciate that because that's how I think. So thank you for, for doing this for these questions. I really like the answers. Um, uh, okay, good. Um, what does success mean for you? Well, well that's the little zinger at the end, right? It is, yeah. <laughs> um, well, the, I, to me, in leaving, and I've had a near-death experience uh, about seven or eight years ago. And um, I had a liver failure. And it, it turns out I had a congenital defect of a bile duct, which just blocked up and literally, you know, kind of blew up my liver. And so in, in being in that, you know, kind of in between state, I did have to kind of face the answer to that question firsthand. And I didn't come up with this original set of words because I, I actually heard it recently, but I said, that is what I feel. And to have increased the flow of goodness in the world is what to be, you know, when I leave and pass to the next world, I hope that I can look back at, at my life and say, yes. I increase the flow of goodness. Very good answer. Very, very good answer. Um, the most important uh, question would be where can people go to connect with yourself? <laughs> Calafia, where, where are all the, where are all the places, you know, that's, we have to get this on, on, uh, on record. That's the most important. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, we have some great retail partners. Whole Foods has always been a huge supporter of Calafia. Target is a great supporter, but most recently we've been delighted to find out that even, you would say even, but people at Walmart are hungry for really good dairy alternatives and you can find the product there as well. So probably any major retailer in the United States, but, and we are, I am proud to say the top selling oat milk on Amazon. So if you want to get, uh, you know, any plant milk um, in a shelf stable format for your pantry, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, but main thing is try to get to califia.com, califiafarms.com. Mm -hmm. And on califiafarms.com, you can look at length at any of our products, you know, stories about the company. And um, we try to keep a pretty artistic Instagram account for people to just, you know, uh, bring more interesting visual uh, design into their lives. So those are those are some good starting points for people to discover Calpia. Perfect. Yeah, you actually have a, a really nice looking Instagram. I'm just taking a look at it now. It's a, you have coffee hacks on there. I, I've I, I've never <laughs> been on your Instagram before right now. So I'm gonna have to. If there's coffee hacks, I gotta <laughs> I gotta I gotta go look. I gotta go well, look and see. 
Yeah, they're a little bit tongue in cheek, but but uh, they do come in handy. Very good, uh, very good. So, all right, th- thank thanks, you. Scott. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. That was really good. I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate All right. it. Well, I, I'm in an inspiring place. So the Sierra Nevadas and uh, I have a view down one of the deepest valleys in the world, you know, so <laughs> it's uh, it's an inspirational place to talk to you. So oh, thank you so much. I'm glad I got you now.